Can I get some coffee and some tea and some fruit? Excellent. You guys got to wake up. Um, our next presenter is Greg Heist from Gongos Research, uh, some good friends of mine. And Greg over at Gongos is responsible for guiding the innovation strategy uh, at Gongos and leading both the team of developers and the company's innovation think tank. So a really great you know, mix of roles over there uh, from technology to solutions and strategy uh, that puts him in a really unique position uh, to talk about what he's going to talk about today in terms of anonymity and authenticity in research, which when you think about the two together, uh, can be quite interesting. Craig's had over 20 years of research under his belt uh, and a visionary at heart, and he believes that we're in the midst of a revolution in the way we conduct research, uh, and he shares his thoughts on the Go Innovate blog, so if you haven't checked that out, I definitely advise it. It's a good read, and there's always something interesting up there. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to bring Greg up here and let him take the stage. Let's give Greg a hand. Since we're all of this here at a technology conference with respect to marketing research, um, basically what I want to do today is I want to focus on three key areas where research is changing dramatically. Um, and what I'm kind of looking at these is, is as social technologies and their effect on research. So throughout the presentation today, what we're going to be talking about are actually three key things. One is public social networking. Okay, so obviously a lot of us, a lot of talk about. Uh, the use of social networking publicly to learn more about consumers' lives and, and their attitudes and beliefs. Um, we're also going to talk about private social networking, or MROCs, or as we call them, research community. And what we want to do is we want to compare and contrast them. And then third, we want to overlay this with the you know, rapidly emerging area of smartphone technology. Now, at the end of the day, there's something that we all really want to understand. This is it. As researchers, which consumer are we getting? And I love this image because it kind of really points to the question that we want to explore today. And what we're going to be talking about is the results of some work that we did, a study that we actually conducted uh, for this conference to explore these issues. So um, that's what we want to do. Now, from my perspective, a thing that we have to really keep in mind is that this is new for humans. Okay, if you think about the long millions of years that we've been around, um, this idea of how we interact with technology and how we express ourselves to, through technology is relatively new. Um, and when we kind of look at these social technologies, this is extremely new. So what I want to do is, before we do this, we're actually fundamentally talking about humans engaging with technology. So what I want to do is I want to take you through a little bit of a journey on exploring a little bit about ourselves. The idea of, of the self. And these uh, rather somber looking dudes were both my mentors and tour mentors during graduate school. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about existential psychology. I want to start of all just kind of talking a little about the idea of the self as it's expressed with respect to existential psychology. And then take a look at our culture and also then how those two things, these dynamics that are within ourselves um, from an existential perspective, manifest themselves as we interact with technology. So let's talk a little, about, a little bit about this. So um, Steve Jobs, uh, in his uh, commencement address uh, at Stanford, I think actually gave one of, the, one of the wisest synopses of what existentialism is all about. He said that death is perhaps life's greatest invention. So sometimes when we think about existentialism, we think about these dudes that are sort of you know, focused on death, and they're obsessed with this idea that we only have so much time here on the earth. But what Jobs here said is really how Existentialism is truly a very life-affirming philosophy in the sense that by being aware of the fact that we all have an end to our life, we try to live our lives as powerfully and meaningfully as possible on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay? So, so some of the fundamental sort of ideas of how we think about ourselves is um, that we create meaning. So we strive throughout our entire life to create meaningful experiences and to make meaning out of the chaos that is our world. Okay? So that's one driver. Um, another one is that we self-preserve. So we identify threats to our lives or to our identities, and we take steps to try to kind of counteract that. The third is we have absolute freedom to choose and live as we wish, but we also have to accept fundamental responsibility for all those actions. Okay? So that's kind of like some of the key dynamics of how we think about being as an existential psychologist. Um, but there's another piece, which is we go from being ourselves to having to interact with other people. And so this fourth point here is 
uh, begins to get us sort of closer to this idea of what we're talking about for this, for this session, which is we seek and show empathy. We try to connect with others. We try to reach out to them. We try to develop deep and meaningful relationships that allow ourselves to express ourselves and be with others in, in a real way. But one of the core um, tensions that we live in as human beings is this idea of authenticity and conformity. So from a psychological perspective, authenticity is about really truly expressing the innermost uniqueness of who we are as people and expressing it in the world without fear. Well, at the same time, um, we interact with people all the time, and we have to, within various elements of our lives, conform. So if you think about, I mean, the prime example is, you know, I'm working in my garage, and I hit my thumb, and my child, my five-year-old son, or my three-year-old son is by me. I can't say exactly what's on my mind at that moment. Kind of. I have to conform who I am to who I'm with. And if you think about it, um, we do that all the time. So if I am one way at work, I express a certain aspect of myself at work, and I have to conform within the bounds of that. I express myself differently with my friends from high school, and I certainly express myself differently with my wife. So this is a natural part of who we are as human beings, and at the same time, we have this drive to continually try to be who we truly are. So that's kind of a fundamental tension I want you to think about as we go through this presentation, because if you think about it, as researchers, we want the authentic. We want to understand consumers as they are. So that's what we're going to try to explore, is how can, we, how can these different technologies um, help us get closer to who, who consumers really are as human beings. So that's kind of the psychology portion. That part of the class is over. Now, let's talk about our culture and our culture's impact on itself. So the image here is of sort of the, you know, almost like the happy days version of family life back in the 50s. It was a very different world. Um, we lived close together with a lot of people. More people tended to live in small cities. They were much closer physically with their families. But our culture is very different now, isn't it? We have very transient lifestyles. We live, families live very far apart from one another. Our friends live very far apart from one another. Um, our speed of life, our speed of life is unbelievable. It's even affecting our children. Our children live this life that feels so much faster than the life we live when we did. So what's the net effect of that? Well, the net effect of it from an existential perspective is we're isolated. Okay? And we're isolated in a few different, a couple different ways. One is, it's true, we are physically isolated from our family and friends. We live farther apart than we ever used to. But this pace of life also helps, it keeps us from being present to one another in a way we would if we had more time. Um, it also, kind of, because of the pace of life, it also disconnects us from ourselves. That's another sort of existential perspective that we can become disconnected from who we are as people. So this is our state. This is the modern world that we live in. And so in that state, uh, in fact, if you take a look at social research, uh, we are more isolated and more lonely than ever as a culture. In fact, there's a really interesting article in the current issue of Atlantic, which is entitled, Is Facebook Making Us Lonely? And they cite some social, stati social um, science statistics that show that we have fewer confidants than we ever had before. Um, and so this idea of we are further apart, we don't have these people with whom we can relate. And so therefore, enter social networks. Move back one slide here, one frame. So given that this is who we are as people, this is our culture, these are our needs, is it any wonder that social networking has become so powerful? It's not just a fad, it is truly, again, if you take a look at it from a psychological perspective, it's an imperative given our culture that we live in today. Okay? So what is it about social networks that are so powerful from a psychological perspective? Well, one is it transcends distance and time. Okay? So if you think about your experience of, let's say, Facebook, we'll use that as the most prominent example. Right? No matter where you, your friends are, no matter where they are, they can be with you. You can connect. It does also transcend time in a certain sense because it's not like we have to physically be with someone in real time for them to share the experiences that they live in a day-to-day -day life with us. Okay? The other is that it connects us with our tribe. Now, we can argue whether this is a, the most deep and meaningful and best connection that we can have, but it is powerful as a platform and as a technology because it does connect us with our tribe and our extended tribe in ways that we didn't have before we had social, social media. Um, it also dynamically expands our social sphere. So with social networking, we create now not just a core group of people, but we can have multiple 
groups of people that we dynamically are related to that we would otherwise never physically meet. But this begins to, and this is an example, this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you um, a, a short video courtesy of Facebook story, story that I think really encapsulates and summarizes this uh, really well. Particularly long road trip. Having Facebook really sort of allowed me to bring everybody along with me. It was as if my 250 Facebook friends were, were kind of a part of the journey. All I had to do was post a couple pictures and all of a sudden I have, I have comments from, from my dad in South Africa or from my, you know, my mom in Mellon Park or my friends I went to college with in upstate New York. And they're all, they're all, they're all, they're all wanting to go on a big road trip. My uncle had passed away and he left me you know, not a lot of money, but enough to fund a, an epically long road trip. Having Facebook really sort of allowed me to bring everybody along with me. It was as if my 250 Facebook friends were, were kind of a part of the journey. All I had to do was post a couple pictures, and all of a sudden I have, I have comments from, from my dad in South Africa, or from my, you know, my mom in Mellon Park, or my friends I went to college with in upstate New York. And they're all, they're all there. You know, seeing the same things that I've seen, there's so much to see and so much to do that, like, I just sort of threw it up to my to my Facebook peeps, you know, entering the evil car on. And so I got three responses. The first one was, you gotta go to Idaho Springs, go to Bojo's Pizza, it's the bomb. And the second one, you gotta go to Lake Sylvan National Park, it's beautiful, we we'll love it. The third one was like, bail on Colorado, the Giants are playing the Cardinals, go to St. Louis. First time when I really realized that Facebook was gonna was a tool for both, not just for recording the trip, but also sort of could be used to lead my trip. And I started with 250 friends. By the time I came back, I had almost 800. So if you think about the things we just talked about, this idea of transcending distance and time and reconnecting with our tribe and um, dynamically expanding our social network, this video, this, this video perfectly encapsulates that. Now, we go back to what we were talking about earlier, which is, all right, so we begin to interact with people now instead of face-to-face, -face, we're interacting with them virtually. Um, you know, now we have lots of different social networks, and as a result, we can have lots of different social spheres that may or may not intersect with one another. And the fundamental question becomes, do we have a different self? Or do we express different selves through social media? And that's really what we wanted to explore in this study. Um, and so what we did is we explored three key things. I'm going to do this and I'll walk you through the study that we conducted, but at a high level, we want to explore anonymity, authenticity, what is being shared from a perspective that we care about as researchers, which is products, services, brands, etc. So let's kind of go through what we what we explored. So first of all, with respect to public social networking, what we did, oops, double click. We explored the issue of openness and censorship. So how open are people when they share, uh, let's say on Facebook, or how censored are they? Um, what is the nature of their product and service chat? Okay, is it across the board, or does it change? Is it certain types of products? Um, what is that? Is there a positive or negative bias to the chat? Okay, so again, as researchers, we're, we would want to know about that. And also, um, what about cross-platform comparison? So do people share differently in different platforms? Now, I, I want to let you know that there's so much here that we studied. I'm going to give you just a very high level summary of it, um, but there's a lot here. The second is we took a look at private social networks, so research communities. And we said, to what degree does anonymity affect expression? And again, as researchers, with respect to what we're most interested in product, services, and brands. And then finally, which is really the core of our, our, our study here, is to what degree do smartphones affect authenticity? what consumers express. So that's really what we, we wanted to set up to study. So here's a little bit about what we, what we did in this. We talked to 1,000 adults aged 18 to 65. We wanted people who um, participated in both public and private social networks. So we have a proprietary uh, community that we own of 40,000 consumers. So we selected 1,000 of them um, to ask these questions. And then also we did a mix of smartphone and non-smartphone owners again to take a look at how does using a smartphone affect how people express themselves. On the back end, we did a tremendous amount of analysis. We did shade, we did data modeling, we did correlation analysis, factor analysis. Um, and I am, this presentation is blissfully free of numbers. So I want you to, as you see, don't see a lot of numbers. Please don't know that there are not a lot of numbers behind this because there 